and as a number of you mentioned, we don't know all of what's down there, the mysteries of the deep. At 500 feet, there's no light, and the pressure is enormous. The creatures that live at these great depths do not have air in their bodies, like the swim bladders of fish that live closer to the surface. So without the air in their bodies, the pressure problem is solved. Other fish, crab, octopus, worms, limpets, clams, some of the creatures that are found down there in the depths. So for 4.5 billion years, the oceans defined the planet. For 4.5 billion years, the oceans were defining Earth. All of the life in the ocean, from the microbes to the phytoplankton, the fish, up to the whales, it's like an orchestra playing in this great symphony. It's all these harmonies, things working together. The ocean has been the great stabilizing factor for nature. Remember, all of the air that we breathe, all of the water that we drink, everything has been touched by the ocean. And yet today, it's humans that are now defining the ocean, creating a discord rather than living in harmony. So these are the, the natural currents of the ocean. They call them gyres. This illustration shows the major ocean currents throughout the globe. Ocean currents act as the conveyor belt of warm and cold water. They send warm heat toward the polar regions, and then they help the tropical regions to cool off. So it's balancing, right, these, these cycles of cool and warm. As you know, warm air rises, cool air falls. But it's true of ocean currents as well. So because of these patterns, it affects both our weather and our climate. Ocean currents act much like a conveyor belt, transporting warm water and precipitation from the equator toward the North and South Poles, and then they bring the cold water from the poles back to the tropics. So these ocean currents help to regulate global climate, um, helping to counteract the uneven distribution of solar radiation, because as we know, the sun hits the equator all the time. So we need to be cycling that warmth around the planet. And it's because of these, these natural ocean cycles that that happens. Without currents in the ocean, regional temperatures would be much more extreme, super hot at the equator and frigid toward the poles, and much less of Earth's land would be inhabitable. Those currents are doing other things too. We're gonna to look specifically at the North Pacific gyre as an example. Right now in the North Pacific, there is a, what they call the garbage patch. So there's the western garbage patch, the eastern garbage patch, and then up here, whoops, up here is where they converge, up here at the top. And a gentleman named Charles Moore decided instead of sailing around that area of, of where that air cycles, he decided to uh, go straight through. Um, what he discovered, this was in 1997, he discovered that there was a mishmash of floating plastic bottles and other debris on his way home toward Los Angeles. The area in the center of the gyre tends to be very calm and stable. And so that circular motion of the currents draws debris in to where that, the things are stable and then that stuff becomes trapped. So a plastic water bottle discar discarded off the coast of California, for instance, takes the California current south toward Mexico, and there it might catch the North Equatorial Current, and then from there it will cross the Pacific, and near the coast of Japan, the bottle may travel north on the Kuroshio Current, and finally the bottle travels eastward on the North Pacific Current, and eventually, it just kind of draws that bottle right into the center. So microplastics make up 94% of an estimated 1.8 trillion pieces of plastic stuck in this patch. 
but that only amounts to about 8% of the total tonnage of plastic. So microplastics are everywhere, but they don't weigh a whole lot. So what really makes up um, a lot of that garbage is abandoned fishing gear. They say 46% of what's in that, stuck in that garbage patch is abandoned fishing gear. They call it ghost fishing. When a fishing net gets separated from its owners and it gets sucked into this current and makes its way into this garbage patch. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is not only the only marine vortex like this, but it is the largest one. There are also patches like this in the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. So even in the North Sea, places where there are common shipping routes, um, these, these same currents are happening. So nearly every molecule of plastic that's been created is still here on Earth. It's not going away. It's estimated that by 2050, the ocean will contain more plastic by weight than fish. The plastic will weigh more than the fish. So this is Charles who made this discovery. The production of plastics worldwide from 1950, so in 1950, prior to 1950, there was no plastic. And since that time, the production of plastic has continued to rise and rise until now there were 390 million tons of plastic produced in 2021. Globally, humans buy a million plastic water bottles per minute. 91% of the plastic is not recycled. So what ends up happening to it? Places like this, this is a beach in Munkar on the island of Java. 400 yard wide, mile long stretch of sand was feet deep in foul smelling sauce packets, shopping bags, diapers, bottles, plastic clothes, you know, things that are made of, we think of nylon as like a fabric, but that's really just plastic in a different form. Detergent bottles. So bulldozers had cleared away and buried a big portion of this plastic and sand two years ago, but every tide since then has just continued to wash up more and more um, from the ocean, but then also that the trash problem in Java, things are washing down the rivers as well. So it's started to be an issue because it was getting in the propellers of the boats is what people drew people's attention to the fact that this was a problem. So Project Stop has empowered people and create, created change. They're working toward reducing this plastic problem. A couple of years ago, I went to Galveston, Texas, and there are trash cans about every 50 yards along the beach, encouraging people to pick things up, and it just keeps getting washed in. And the number of people that I watched just walk by the trash and walk by the trash cans was also interesting, a cultural story. So what else is affected by this plastic invasion? I'd like you to take in a video, and we'll start for us. I saw that 19 of you went to the Albatross movie. I think this piece is important enough that I'm gonna bring a glimpse of it to show you now. I encourage you not to look away.
we have the courage to face the realities of our time and allow ourselves to feel deeply enough that it transforms us and our future. whale on the California coast with 400 pounds of plastic in its stomach. What is certain is that the calls for reduction in plastic will grow louder and the industry will resist. But unless we find ways to use less, most of the efforts to end the flood of plastic entering the environment, it's going to be hard. But plastic isn't the only challenge that the ocean realm is facing. Longline fishing is part of the story. I'm not trashing fishing. Um, fishing, like so many things, has evolved in the name of efficiency. So how long are long lines? Some are one mile and some are 50 miles long, baited with these fishing hooks. I learned from Sylvia Earle that sharks and many of other creatures are often caught by accident this way, not just getting what the fishermen are hoping for, but getting all these other things too. And not just long lines, there's also this system of fishing called trawling, where they drag a net like this along the bottom of the ocean and collect things at, obviously at different levels of the ocean and uh, super trawlers are now a thing. These nets are large enough to hold 13 jumbo jets, and they're working in the oceans all around the world. So the name of efficiency, the disconnect that's happening. Satellite imagery reveals that bottom trawling for fish stirs up these billowing plumes of sediment that can be seen from space and, and destroys entire uh, ecosystems on the sea floor. So what happens after a bottom trawler drags along this ocean floor? The most destructive of any actions that humans conduct in the ocean, says zoologist in, at the University of Hawaii. It's pulling up absolutely everything on the floor and leaving nothing behind. So what happens in these situations, these nets, are that they catch all kinds of stuff in there. They call it bycatch. Sea turtles are caught in there, and whales and dolphins are caught in there. If, if a mother whale get or a mother dolphin gets caught in the net, um, or if a baby dolphin gets caught in the net, the mother will stay with it and likely also perish. The ocean is a resource in these cases. There is this sense of separation absence of appreciation for all of the connections, all of that web of life. <coughs> Sylvia Earle said that 90% of the big fish are gone. She says, we can be, this quote is really important, we can be the saviors of humankind. I say humankind because life will go on with <coughs> us or without us. It did before and it can after. It just won't be the same assemblage of life. We're already altering the pieces of the puzzle. 
We've lost a lot of species due to our actions. When we destroy a coral reef, we lose its residents, all the unique species that evolve there and nowhere else in the universe. Some species of lizardfish have a very limited range, or shrimp-like creatures called stomopods that have unique eyes that see a much broader spectrum of light than humans can. So we destroy the reef and we lose that piece of the puzzle and we'll never have a complete picture again. Species extinction, we touched on this with birds a little bit the other day. Species extinction, this is the curve of how many things have been extinct. Amphibians, reptiles, mammals, fish, birds, insects. In the three billion birds lost video we watched on Wednesday, they mentioned that grassland species of birds are doing better because people are taking action. They're protecting those habitats, making regulations to support them, and it's working. So if we put our collective energy toward these challenges, we can make change for the better, too. So when you look at these fish, look at them closely. Take a really good, close look. They're all the same kind of fish, and yet they're each individuals. They must know their places and spaces just like we do. They have routines and they have patterns of life just like we do. When you look at them like that, it's not as a commodity, it's not as big business. They have homes and they have communities. Sylvia Earle says a lot of people excuse their bad behavior toward fish saying, oh, they don't feel pain. And that's nonsense. Fish have all the same equipment that we do to feel pain. Don't try to make up stories to save your own conscience. You either choose to inflict pain on other creatures, or you don't. So seeing fish and sea creatures with new eyes. Some of you spoke about your feelings of love for the ocean. Love, how do we define love? James T. Farrell of St. Olaf College defines love like this. Something that we want to be physically near. We want the best for it all the time. Think about the things in your life that you say that you love. You fear its loss and grieve for its injuries. You want to know everything about it, its story, its moods, and what it looks like by moonlight. Want to protect it fiercely and are helpless to do so otherwise. And I'd like to add one more. I think there's one thing that's missing for this, from this. When I love something or someone, some place, I want to be my best for that thing. I want to be my best for that thing, bring my whole being to that relationship. So how is it that we can be our best for the oceans or the birds or the trees or the insects or those special places that we love? How can we bring our best to that? We don't deliberately try to hurt the ocean, but we have, and we are. So while about 12% of the land is protected around the world, under some form of protection, like national parks or state parks, less than 6% of the ocean is protected in any way. Hoop spots allow us to plan for the future and look beyond current marine protected areas so this is an example. Each of these little dots represents a hope spot. The idea is that anyone, anyone can nominate a special hope spot, a site that gives hope and joy. Collectively, these hope spots will create a global wave of community support for ocean conservation. Leaders and policymakers can't ignore this when there are people speaking up. 
Preservation of natural habitats is not a partisan issue. It's not Republican or Democrat. This is a human-centric challenge. We need to speak up about this. This is a matter of survival for us and for all those other species. We have better parts of our human nature that we can use to save and value nature beyond our immediate desires. The ocean has been the great stabilizing factor for this planet, and we can make it that way again if we choose to. If you want to check out this movie, Mission Blue, I think it's pretty inspiring. So with every breath you take, the ocean assists you. Every breath you take, wherever you are, even if you never see it. You never see your heart either, but I bet you're glad that it exists. So this week for your pack back question, Doug asked you this the other day. Why should we, we talk about why we should care about the birds? So what about it for you? You all get a chance to reflect on this as well. Why care? I hope that you have a beautiful day, and I'll see you on Wednesday.